Are you tired of spending more time trying to schedule game night than actually playing? Is a huge part of the effort you spend prepping to run D&D or other TTRPGs spent coordinating people's calendars? Have you ever spent time and effort weaving characters' backstories into like a grand narrative only to have a PC death or player no-shows or general indifference make you feel like you have wasted all your work? Do you feel like too much responsibility falls on the Dungeon Master's shoulders and wish the players would take a little more initiative inside and outside of the game? Well, you are not the first, and someone has created an answer that might solve all, or at least most, of these problems and prevent the dreaded DM burnout. In this one, we're talking about the West Marches style of D&D campaigns. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Verdigree Table. I'm Ryan Doyle, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the West Marches might be one of the most widely recognized settings for Dungeons and Dragons, and that is especially impressive considering you won't find it in any book published by TSR or Wizards of the Coast. It's more famous than some official D&D settings, at least the name is. And while most people know probably little to nothing about the world or lore of the West Marches, the style of play it embodied has gained something of a cult following, and it is easy to understand why, as some of the unique innovations it brings to the table can actually fix a lot of common issues plaguing many games. This is from the creator. Check it out. West Marches was a game I ran for a little over two years. It was designed to be pretty much the diametric opposite of the normal weekly game. One, there was no regular time. Every session was scheduled by players on the fly. Two, there was no regular party. Each game had different players drawn from a pool of around 10 to 14 people. Three, there was no regular plot. The players decided where to go and what to do. It was a sandbox game in the sense that's now used to describe video games like Grand Theft Auto, minus the missions. There was no mysterious old man sending them on quests, no overarching plot, just an overarching environment. My motivation in setting things up this way was to overcome player apathy and mindless plot following by putting the players in charge of both scheduling and what they did in-game. A secondary goal was to make the schedule adapt to the complex lives of adults. Ad hoc scheduling and a flexible roster meant ideally people got to play when they could but didn't hold up the game for everyone else if they couldn't. If you can play once a week, that's fine. If you can only play once a month, that's fine too. This player-driven approach is wildly different than what most of us are doing, right? Now, depending on where you and your group are in your D&D journey, this might sound super appealing or crazy and impossible. Either way, let me explain. But first, let's give credit where credit is due. The West Marches and the blog posts that introduced it to the world are products of the mind of Ben Robbins. He's also created a suite of games that are innovative and fun, which you can use to trick your players into helping you do all of or a lot of your Dungeon Master prep. And I'm only half kidding there. Union gamifies creating bloodlines and family histories. Playing Kingdom generates dynamic organizations and communities, factions or cultures. And the flagship Microscope creates whole worlds full of history. The Adventure Zone played Microscope to set the stage for their Ether Sea arc, and while it is like a standalone game that can simply fill a night of fun, it's hard to think of a better way to get players engaged and invested than to give them creative control over the world that their characters are about to explore. But game design, bona fides aside, Ben Robbins wrote these blog posts about the structure of his D&D home game, and oh man, did I find it inspiring when I first stumbled on these ideas. The role of schedule coordinator often falls on the dungeon master, but why is that the built-in assumption? Don't we already have enough to do? Let's let the players get together and figure out what time works with everybody's schedules, then approach the DM with options. In the 15 years since these blog posts went up, technology has only made that easier. The original game used an email list, but you could use a group text or a Google Doc or a Facebook group, subreddit. There are a ton of options and more on the way, I am sure. I like Discord for running my games, and there's a host of bots that can make that and scheduling easier. I also like Discord for connecting the growing community of folks who are watching these videos. Check the link in the description and come join the conversation. 
Now, if you take just this single idea of sharing the scheduling burden back to your home game, this video might be worth the price of admission and make life easier. My approach to dungeon mastering and a lot of areas in life is to take what works for you and leave the rest. I see the West Marches as not one like monolithic thing, but a constellation of ideas. And you can treat it like a pick and mix or like an all you can eat buffet. You can also modify things to suit your tastes and situations. For me, I typically only have like a few nights open and I actually really like knowing that like Tuesday night is game night. So I have found it's perfectly okay for the DM to announce that they are free on Tuesday days and Thursday nights plus every other Saturday or whatever and you can still totally benefit from having players sign up for these slots and decide what they want to do with them and while you can definitely like mix and match aspects of the West March's style don't just like dismiss number two as outlandish without hearing it out you might be having a hard time getting three or four players around the table making the idea of juggling more players seem laughable but it's actually way easier to get games going with a big pool of players because the majority of them can be unavailable on any given night and you can still play i think you'll find it's easy to build a big pool of players if you are kind and put yourself out there there is a big dm shortage and a player surplus today and i don't see that changing anytime soon build it and the players will come consistent players different story maybe but with the west march's style of play that no longer matters and if you're anything like me playing more games with more people is a very exciting prospect now having no regular party might seem like a big hurdle if you're not used to viewing campaigns this way but think of like comics different groups of heroes setting out from the Xavier School or the Justice League or Avengers HQ every time, right? You get more of an episodic feel at the cost of those like big overarching campaign stories, sure, but that can be a nice change of pace. And honestly, how often have you seen your big plot actually conclude before scheduling killed the campaign? Have you ever like carefully intertwined all the characters' backstories into your grand narrative only to have somebody drop out? Well, it can be incredibly liberating to realize the third point here is even an option. You don't need a regular plot. In fact, getting rid of that might free the DM up from a lot of constraints and disappointments while liberating the players from the worst aspects of railroading. Now, there's nothing wrong with a story that has a beginning and a middle and an end, right? Despite when some D&D advice out there might have you believe, but Sandbox is also an option, and man, did I enjoy exploring the wide open world in games like GTA and WoW back in the day. Now I love bringing that feeling to my D&D. Sure, it can take some extra work up front, but unlike prepping plots, that work is almost never wasted. Now, the general rule of thumb for building a successful sandbox is that you'll need around three times the amount of material compared to like a typical linear adventure. Well, guess where you can find playlists walking through Dungeon Master Prep for three different published campaigns up here on YouTube to help you get going way more easily. I've also got some one-shots on the DMs Guild designed to be dragged and dropped into a sandbox, as well as integrated encounter tables that I originally started building for myself to foster this style of play, and now are some of my favorite Dungeon Master tools out there. I have put everything up in the samples on the DMs Guild so you can check it out and download it for free, but if you can spare a couple bucks, I always appreciate it. There's also a growing amount of material that's great for this up on my Patreon as well with more and more added every month. If you enjoy what I'm doing here and want to help me keep doing it, I deeply appreciate all levels of support. You get rewarded and it makes all this free content possible. And while it's true that you do want a lot of content handy, in a West Marches style game, you don't need to have any of it prepped before the players let you know they're headed that way. It's the best of both worlds. The players can go anywhere, pretty much, but they tell you ahead of time so you can ready only what you need when you need it, kind of like on-demand DM prep. This takes another big burden off of the Dungeon Master. Scheduling is one thing. Always deciding what is happening next inside the game is another. Part of playing in a sandbox is putting more control and responsibility in the hands of the players to drive the action. But the West Marches takes that a step further by formally having the players 
declare their intentions as part of setting up the session in the first place. It is actually part of the scheduling process. Hey, is anyone around to explore the crypts of Kolos next weekend? And now everybody shows up motivated to go on this particular quest. Ben Robbins talks about how he just had a bunch of names on his map and only filled out the details once the players were heading that way. You could take some of the locations around Fandolin, right? From Lost Mine of Fandelver, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak, put the Sunless Citadel and or the Forge of Fury on the map, drop in the Tower of Rhydol, maybe the Forest from Dryad's Fury in there for good measure. Then you wait for the players to declare where they are going before you prepare anything. When you're laying things out, keep in mind that it makes sense to have concentric circles of difficulty around that starting location. The characters have to make it through tier one content before they get to tier two challenges. Most people are going to understand this intuitively because it's the way so many games are laid out. But it also makes sense narratively. The further from civilization we wander, the more dangerous things get. However, and I love this, in the OG West Marches, there were like these spikes of difficulty. Think about the hobbits wandering into the Barrow Downs early in their journey. It's deadly and easily avoided, but you know there's gotta be some cool treasure in there. So do, do you take the risk? I'm not sure Tom Bombadil will show up to save you. As adventure locations are discovered and explored, you can keep adding more to the map. And this will more or less coincide with the characters leveling up and you needing higher level content. You can also restock cleared sites as well. Sure, you killed all the goblins in the Sunless Citadel, but a cult has taken over the lower levels now and are opening a portal to the abyss. The map stays the same, but also keeps changing. Speaking of maps, here comes another element of the West Marches that you can take kind of a la carte and consider bringing over to your home game, whether you're running this style of play or not. And honestly, this might be my favorite idea in this series of articles that is filled with great ideas. The characters start by sitting around a table in a tavern, as is tradition. Fight me about it in the comments. But upon this tavern table is a map of the local area carved by adventurers of the past. Incomplete, of course, and maybe of questionable accuracy. And now, as the characters go out, explore, and come back to town, they can add to this map and share information with the other players who, remember, might not have been there when the party saw that abandoned wizard's tower on the hill or caught sight of the stone tooth on the horizon. I love encouraging players to get creative and it doesn't get more creative than literally creating things whether it is physical or digital having your players mapping out the world you are describing is an incredible experience trust me a collectively crafted artifact of your game world made manifest what happens if the map isn't 100 accurate that's a feature not a bug because the characters would not necessarily have like a perfect one-to-one -one representation of things if something is off and will really screw things up especially if the characters would know better but the players got confused somewhere along the way okay sure maybe offer a correction it's actually a very nice way to reward a player for spending proficiency in cartographers tools there is also a chance that the players will get something wrong and you'll like their version better, so you'll change your world to match their map. Now, it may or may not be clear by now that the players sharing information with each other becomes kind of pivotal to have a West Marches campaign feel like a cohesive game and not just like a disjointed series of one shots. Ben Robbins suggests encouraging players to write session recaps and says that in the original game, these were like celebrated creative works in their own right, which kept the players engaged and excited between game sessions. Again, even if you are running a more traditional style, getting players to record and like share their field reports can be awesome for everyone involved. It's great for when someone misses a game night or when you wanna look back to remember some detail of a session long past or simply reminisce. I've got a player doing it in character at my table right now and everybody looks forward to the chronicles of Ticklefang getting posted after each session. When I set up my first West Marches game, I actually incentivized players to write these recaps by providing in-game rewards. The eccentric noble who owned the Broad Axe Tavern and was establishing a league of adventurers who was also secretly a Rakshasha would pay handsomely for additions to the library, handing out gems and potions 
for artifacts and recaps and field reports. To my mind, the key to making this idea that a different combination of characters could adventure together every time work easily in-game is to have each session begin, and more importantly, finish in town. Using the safe haven rules for long rest that we talked about is a great way to handle this mechanically, links where the links go. Also, explaining to the players out of game that things work way better if the characters make it back to the tavern before the session ends helps a lot. There's an added benefit here if we've got like a hard cutoff time for game night because of real world obligations. Now there's also a reason for everyone to watch the clock and prioritize pacing. Making it home safe with all that treasure can be an adventure in its own right. Some games just use like a roll to return mechanic if you're out of time and or you want to leave it for the dice to decide if you make it back in one piece. Otherwise, you can kind of just hand wave it or maybe give out like hearthstones that teleport you back to the tavern, perhaps with an associated price. Whatever it takes to get characters back to town and available for the next adventure. In the original West Marches, the fact that there was no adventure to be had in town was a core principle. And I think it comes down to personal preference, and you can take it or leave it without stopping most parties from heading out to explore the wilderness eventually. But that being said, when I ran this the first time, I had all of the town business, shopping mostly, but some RP opportunities happening on the Discord server outside of game night. This potentially creates another element of engagement between sessions and keeps the players thinking about the game and the world and the characters, getting them motivated to go on the next adventure. Now that, that's the good stuff, if you can get it. Imagine a big pool of players comparing notes and plotting with each other all week, watching locations get added to the map and re reading field reports from past adventurers and exchanging rumors and clues, vying to get a group together to explore something that they saw or heard about, approaching the dungeon master saying, can you run that mysterious mine in the Ashcap Mountains on Wednesday? We've got four players ready who are super excited to explore it. Ben Robbins deserves a ton of credit for succinctly paving the way to create such a player-driven D&D campaign. Definitely go check out those articles. There are some other gems in there that we didn't get into. Let me know in the comments if you want a deeper dive into West March's style play, and maybe we will revisit this topic later. But one thing he doesn't talk about in those articles, and it's kind of sitting right there with the other games he's created, is the idea of taking the West March's style of play one step further. No set schedule, no set party, no set plot, and no set DM, maybe even no set game system. We talked about that a little bit in the open table video, and I've got big plans to help you achieve it. But first, we're going to take a look at some other games beyond D&D that you might want to add to the rotation. Like and subscribe so you don't miss that. Help support us on Patreon for more great stuff. Be kind, have fun, and I will see you next time. Thanks so much for watching.